Let's open our Bibles together to Matthew chapter 27. Share with you today out of verses 27 through 50 as we celebrate together Good Friday. I began reading at verse 27. I'll read to verse 50, and we'll get into our study. Matthew chapter 27, beginning at verse 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium, gathered the whole garrison around him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. They bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. Now as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of a skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Then they crucified him, divided his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garment among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there. And they put up over his head the accusation written against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroyed the temple and built it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he is the King of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him for now. Let him deliver him now. If he will have him, for he said, I am the Son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Now, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there, when they heard that, said, This man's calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Perhaps you've wondered, like I have in the past, why today is called Good Friday. I read the Friday that Jesus was crucified on has been called Good Friday because it led to the resurrection of Jesus and his victory over death and sin and the celebration of Easter, the very pinnacle of Christian celebrations. Good Friday is celebrated because it commemorates the single most important event in history when the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ hung on a cross to bear the wrath of God in the place of those who would place their faith in him, and be his followers. You see, this single act of love and grace for us makes us realize that indeed this is what is called a Good Friday. The last week of Jesus' life was filled with activity. As you read the scriptures pertaining to that last week, you see that he entered into the city of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. On Monday, he returned to Jerusalem. He cursed a barren fig tree and he cleansed the temple. On Tuesday, he gave the Mount Olivet Discourse, teaching on end times, speaking of the second coming, speaking of final judgment. The Bible doesn't say what he did on Wednesday. More than likely, he simply rested. But on Thursday, he celebrated the Passover with his disciples. And during the supper, Judas had left to finish the betrayal of Jesus Christ. And when he left, Jesus continued teaching his disciples, and he continued to encourage them. It was on Thursday that he celebrated Passover, washed the feet of his disciples. And that night he instituted the Lord's Supper, which we call communion, using bread and wine as symbols of the life he was yielding on their behalf, teaching his men to remember him. When supper had ended, Jesus and the remaining apostles went to the garden 
And in the garden, Jesus stationed eight at its entrance. He took three deeper in with him. And he instructed these men. He agonized in prayer. He asked God, remove this cup from me. It was in this garden that Judas came with officers and soldiers to arrest him. We remember how the apostle Peter lashed out. He cut off Malchus's ear. He had to be restrained by Jesus. And then they all fled. Jesus was arrested and was first taken to stand before the former high priest, Annas. They next took him before the high priest, Caiaphas. Then they took him before Pilate, then Herod, and back to Pilate. And as this was happening, those who were guarding him blindfolded him. And as they did so, they began to beat him. Mark 14, 65 tells us that some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, to beat him, to say to him, prophesy. The officers struck him with the palms of their hands. After improperly securing a charge against him, he stood before Pilate. His accusers knew that the people were following him in great numbers. Just that week, multitudes had been crying out, Hosanna to him. Matthew 21, 11 tells us the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. And they were envious. And they feared that they would lose their positions. They feared that they would lose the nation itself. And so with this in mind, they secured a charge, a charge that they thought could stick against Jesus Christ. And this is what they told the governor, Pontius Pilate. In Luke 23, verse 2, it says they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation, forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Now, these are serious charges, grave enough to warrant the death penalty. Upon hearing this, Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus asked him if it was his own question, knowing that Pilate was aware of who he was. And like a good politician, Pilate dodged the question and answered the question with a question. Am I a Jew? Your own people and religious leaders delivered you to me. What have you done? After interrogating him, Pilate knew that there was nothing he could charge him with, so he attempted to release him, but the priests and the people would not agree to it. He appealed to a custom that they had during Passover. A criminal would be released of their choice. But instead of Jesus, the priests incited the mob to cry out for a robber, a man by the name of Barabbas. The more Pilate argued for the release of Jesus, the angrier this crowd got. Pilate knew that things were getting out of hand. He finally just gave up. Matthew tells us in chapter 27, verses 24 through 26, that when Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water, washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. He scourged him. And that's what we're seeing here in verse 26 as we look at this passage. It says, he released Barabbas to them, and when he scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. We hear of scourging, and today we really don't understand what that is. We don't have anything in our mind that can help us to, to think of what that could possibly be. When they would scourge someone during this day, the victim would be tied to a post and his hands would be raised over his head, his head, and this would completely expose his back. His face, his neck, back, chest, and midsection, his loins, and his legs would be exposed and unprotected. There were two torturers who took turns striking the victim. The amount of stripes was determined by the commanding officer. Jewish law had set the amount of stripes a guilty man would receive. According to the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy 25 verse 3, they would receive 39 stripes. That was supposed to represent mercy. The torturers used a whip with a short wooden handle with several straps. The straps were embedded with bone, acorn-shaped bits of lead, sharp spikes, and each stroke cut into the flesh until veins and entrails were laid bare. Often the scourge struck the face, knocking out eyes and teeth. 
It normally ended in fainting, even in death. The scourging of Jesus fulfilled a prophecy concerning Messiah. Psalm 129, verses 2 and 3. Many a time they have afflicted me from my youth, yet they have not prevailed against me. The plowers plowed on my back. They made their furrows long. The prophet Isaiah prophesied that this is how Messiah would be treated 700 years before Christ. He wrote in Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6, I gave my back to those who struck me, my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. Isaiah 52, 14, many were amazed when they saw him beaten and bloodied, so disfigured one would scarcely know that he was a person. Isaiah 53, 5, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And so he was scourged, he beaten, and treated with so much disrespect. Again, it says here in verse 27, the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium, gathered the whole garrison around, stripped him, put a scarlet robe on him, twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, a reed in his right hand. They bowed the knee before him, mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, spat on him, took the reed, struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. Now, Pilate turned Jesus over to the Roman soldiers and they treated him shamefully. Notice how he says here, twisting a crown of thorns and placing it upon his bruised head. They gave him a staff, put a robe on him, bowed their knees to him. John informs us that Pilate brought Jesus before his accusers. He was trying to elicit sympathy on behalf of Jesus Christ. In John's Gospel, in chapter 19, verses 4 and 5, it says, After the scourging and mocking, he brought Jesus out and said to them, I find no fault in him. Behold the man. But this only infuriated them. They cried out, Crucify him. Crucify him. Acts 3.13 tells us that Pontius Pilate was determined to let him go, but they resisted this. When he said to them, Behold the man, they desired his death. When he sought to release him, they cried out all the more. They cried, if you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. And that would have been a great, great threat to Pilate because Caesar would execute those who were not completely loyal to him. Pilate knew that. The authorities went on to say, we have no king but Caesar, challenging his loyalty. We know that the result was that he washed his hands of the matter and he had had Jesus led away to die. In spite of everything he saw and everything he heard, he made up his mind to reject Jesus Christ. That takes place today, by the way. There are those who are raised in the church. They're raised with Bible studies. They're raised with devotions. They might even go to Christian schools. They're raised to know the things of the gospel. And yet at a certain age, at a certain place in their life, they begin to think that they know more than God. They know more than Scripture. They know more about life than their parents and those that might instruct them. They know better, but they walk away. They know better. They've been raised right. They've been taught, but they walk away. They walk away because their heart is hardened to the things of God. There's no desire within them to repent, to actually receive, to be changed or transformed. Some raised in Christian homes think that they've been raised in a way that has kept them from enjoying life, that there are things out there that they should go out and find out and do for themselves in order that they might experience fullness of life and the things that life has to offer them. And they make choices contrary to the things that they've been taught. They make choices that end up destroying their lives and breaking their parents' hearts. They make those choices because they're rejecting the things of God. They're rejecting the things they were taught because they think that the things out there are better than the things that they're being held back from and the things that are being given to them. And that's what's taking place. These people knew better. They knew they had heard the claims of Christ, and yet at the same time they were rejecting him. Pontius Pilate, when he was speaking to Jesus, and Jesus was speaking to him, Pontius Pilate, in the conversation with Jesus, Jesus said to him, um, those who are my followers know the truth, and Pontius Pilate looked at him and simply said, what is truth? 
What is truth? He was a hardened politician, a man who had been in various places throughout the world. They'd heard a variety of ways of life and, and, and different kinds of religious beliefs and all. And so he's at that point where he's saying, this is just another podunk town in the world. I'm, a, I'm from the Roman Empire. We have, we have seen some great things. We've seen the, 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 the glory of Rome, and you're here talking to me about truth. Well, what is it? What is it? And he rejected. He rejected what was being told to him. The Bible tells us in verse 31 that they took Jesus' robe off of him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. John tells us in chapter 19, verse 17, carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, Golgotha. By Jewish law, death penalties had to be carried out outside the city. And as they're moving, verse 32 tells us they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and him they compelled to bear him. His cross. They found a man of Cyrene. Cyrene was a Greek settlement in modern Libya. He was likely a Jewish man living there. And Roman law permitted the soldiers to force someone to do this. And so they compelled him to, to bear Jesus' cross. And he bore it, verse 33, to a place called Golgotha, place of a skull. This is just outside the city walls to the north, situated right there on the roadway. And Golgotha, the the, the place of the skull is just above that roadway so that when people would come by, they would see these people who had been crucified as a warning to them. And it says in verse 35, they, they crucified him, divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them for my clothing. They cast lots. At the cross of Christ, we see man's wickedness most completely exposed. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, There is not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. And the execution of Jesus is the greatest proof of the wickedness of man. This demonstrates how far a man can fall. You know, man, men can be very evil. And we, have, we can say evil things. I saw a sign that perhaps some of you saw this. It was a man. This man was holding a sign. And the sign he was holding was captured in a photograph and it was published and the sign read, when Jesus comes, kill him again. And that, that is the, the heart of man. That is the heart of man. We ought not to be shocked by that in the way that we see our world going at this moment. We ought not to be shocked by those kinds of things. But they're there, very open. It's no longer under the surface. It's now risen to the top and expressed openly and even done so for cameras. When Jesus comes, kill him again. The cross. The cross is made of two pieces. It was made up of a post and a cross beam. A cross was normally twice the height of a man. And the crucified person was either fastened to the cross beam while on the ground or raised by cords to the cross beam and then nailed to it. The hands would be pierced at the wrist. The legs would be twisted. The ankles would be nailed to the post without breaking bones. The victim would suffer dislocation at the shoulders, would endure suffocation as the ribs compressed on the lungs. The veins would bulge with blood, and there was congestion of blood in the, the head, lungs, and the heart. The muscles would cramp. Fever and dehydration would set in, as well as shock. And the victim would die of blood loss, shock, and dehydration and that's how they were treating Jesus today we think of the cross and we don't realize what it symbolized the cross was actually Rome's attempt to make the agony of death a prolonged experience in the old times during the days of the Assyrians hundreds of years earlier the Assyrians would take a, a prisoner and they would bring him out to a place and there they would have a young sapling and the sapling may be six inches, the trunk six inches or so in circumference. And they would cut it so that it was just a little bit, about five or six feet from the ground. They would take their, their, their tools and they would, they would begin to whittle the top of it until it was sharp like a pencil. If you picture a pencil with the pencil point up, it would look like that when they were through. Then they would get two of their soldiers and they would take the prisoner and grab him by the arm and by the leg, and they would pull him in opposite directions. They would lift him up, and they would center him on that, on that post. 
and they were so good at it that they could actually pull him down so that the, the point of that post was about an inch or two below the heart. And they would leave him on that, on that spike until his weight and gravity combined and his body slowly but surely began to be pierced by the point until it went straight through his heart and killed him. But for the Romans, that was too quick. There are records where crucified individuals under the Roman crucifixion would actually last days on the cross, three days. Can you imagine the agony that you would experience as your hands are stretched out and your legs are twisted in a serpentine fashion and you have a, a seat that was put on the post that was actually sharpened so that it was pressed into your back, right, right in the middle of your back. So when you were there on the cross and you began to try to breathe, because that's what you would do, you would pull your body up. And as you pulled your body up, that sharpened edge, that saddle seat, would penetrate your back. And every time you took a breath, it would rise and fall, rise and fall, lacerating you every inch of your back. No matter what you did to move to try and save yourself from the pain, it would just be a new groove. And that would go on, not for an hour, not for six hours, not for 24 hours, but up to three days. And they had refined it. And that's what crucifixion was. When you hear that Jesus died on a cross, you need to understand what took place. You need to understand that he was brutalized, that his back was made to look like hamburger, that the beard from his face had been, that they had grabbed handfuls, twisted, and pulled until, until they pulled the beard out of his cheeks. They had taken a reed and they had hit him on the head. His head is already bruised and gashed when they put on his head a crown of thorns. The thorns were an inch and a half long. And they pressed it on his head. They mocked him. They spit on him. They beat him. They put, him, that put the crossbeam on him. They forced him to carry it. They took him to this place where criminals would be put to death. They fastened him on that cross. They lifted him up, and you can almost hear the sound as it fell, that post fell into the hole in the ground that it would lodge in. You can almost hear the dull sound of the thud as it hit and the agony that it would elicit from Jesus as he hits and his body is ripped, his back is open, he's on that saddle, and it's tearing him. And as he's there, he's praying for us. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And that's what Jesus did for us. So often we don't understand that. We call it Good Friday because what he did turned out to be good for us. In verse 37, it says, they, they put over his head the accusation written against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. This is Jesus. It was written actually according to Matthew, Luke, and John. When you combine them, it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And it literally was, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And there he is. And as he's there hanging on that cross, verse 38, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and the other on the left. That fulfills prophecy. Mark tells us in chapter 15, verses 27 and 28, with him they also crucified two robbers, one on his right, the other on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled, which says he was numbered with the transgressors. As this is taking place, verse 39, those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads, saying, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. And likewise, the chief priests also mocking with the scribes and elders said he saved others himself he cannot save. If he's the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross. We'll believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he'll have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Unbelief. You see, Jesus never said that he would destroy the temple. What they're doing is they're casting his teaching at him 
and once again misunderstanding what it is that he said. The chief priests should have known better, but they're taunting him. Psalm 22, 7 and 8 says, All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. And I think that these men who knew the law are most wicked of all. But notice in verse 44, even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him. At first they did. In verse 45, now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over the land. From noon to three is that time. In the Bible, darkness often is a symbol of judgment. In Exodus 10, 21 and 22, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the sky so that darkness will spread over Egypt. Dark, darkness that can be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky and total darkness covered all Egypt for three days. Darkness is often a symbol of judgment. And what this is is a picture of divine judgment. Our sins are being poured out on the Son of God. Darkness is God's reaction. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In verse 46, it says that Jesus cried out with a loud voice around the ninth hour. And he said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Spiritual death is broken communion. Jesus had a taste of such broken communion, the first and last he ever experienced in those desolate hours when darkness lay upon the earth and upon his soul. Jesus was our forerunner in every kind of experience, even to the feeling of God's frown of disapproval on sin, that he might become our high priest, understanding all our infirmities and being tempted in all points like as we, apart from sin. He felt the way a lost sinner feels without himself having sinned. He suffered on that cross, fully experiencing the isolation that sin produces. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says, Surely the arm of the Lord is too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he'll not hear. It was not a separation of his nature, his essence, or his substance. It was a separation of fellowship. And somebody said these words mark the conclusion of the suffering of Jesus for a lost world. Here he drank to the dregs the cup of sorrow, grief, and pain on our behalf. In these hours, when the sun refused to shine upon suffering deity, Jesus found fitting expression to his feeling of desolation in the words of the psalmist. Verse 47, some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a reed, offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and he yielded up his spirit. One of them took a sponge and gave him something to drink. The sour wine that was in it was high in water, low in alcohol. It was used to quench thirst. And he took enough of it so that he could shout. And I want to spend the last couple moments looking at this in verse 50 when it says, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and then yielded up his spirit. I want to look at a couple of things with you as we're going to roll to a conclusion here. He cried out. Notice he cried out with a loud voice. He cried out. What was he crying out? It says, first he had said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. But he also cried out. He cried out, it is finished. And he cried out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When Jesus said, into thy hands I commit my spirit, these words are taken from Psalm 31, verse 5. Into your hand I commit or I entrust my spirit. And I've shared this with you before, but they formed part of the evening prayers for centuries and may have done so for Jesus. This was a prayer 
that the children were taught at an early age when they would go to bed. They would actually pray out of Psalm 31 and they would be closing their, their evening in their last prayer as their head was on their pillow and they would be saying, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now we teach our kids to pray and, and some of us taught our kids, you know, now, you know I lay my down, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the, soul, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And then we go and scare them half out of their minds. If I should die before I wake, are you kidding me? I'll stay awake all night. I'm not going to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to take. That isn't a good prayer. But think about it. When Jesus was small, he more than likely learned this prayer. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. The children would pray that at night. In what we would call a pillow, they would place their head there. And as they placed their head on their pillar and they were laying there and they're saying their, their, their nightly prayer, their, their prayer every night, they would say as they were about to go to sleep and they close their little eyes and they would say, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And then that was their last prayer and they go to sleep. And you have to get the picture of this because Jesus is on a cross and as he's on the cross and his arms are stretched and he's bleeding and he's been praying and he's doing the things that he's doing, this is what he's doing now. He prays, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And just like he had as a child, one last time, he prays, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And he let his head down using the cross as a pillow, and he died. And he died. He said, spirit, be gone. He gave up his life for us. They didn't kill him so much as he yielded himself. They were the instruments of him yielding himself. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. When you think about how much the Lord loves you, I'll always remember my little girl, Corinne, who had, at the year, when she was a year and a half, and I had asked her, I said to her, Honey, how much do you love your daddy? Baby, how much do you love your daddy? And she's just a little girl. I have a picture somewhere of her. She was only a year and a half. And I still remember. I said, How much do you love your daddy? And she says, I love daddy this much. And I said, Oh, that's not very much. I said, That's not much at all. And so she tried to stretch more. And I said, Oh, that's hardly anything. You hardly love me. And I have this picture where she's stretching her arms and her little face is really... Uh, and we took the picture of her and I show it to her every once in a while when I'm mad at her. <laughs> and my mom gave me a plaque that I have somewhere. And the plaque simply has words written on it. I asked the Lord, how much do you love me? And he said this much and he stretched out his hands and he died how much does the Lord love you he stretched out his hands and he said this much and he died good Friday why did he die he took upon himself my sin he paid a price I couldn't pay for myself the Bible teaches us, Christianity teaches that it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Spirit. It isn't that I have worked myself into the kingdom. My good works are not sufficient to outweigh my evil ones. I required a substitute. I required somebody who could pay the price I could not pay. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus took upon himself your sin, my sin. He didn't tell me, try as hard as you can to be perfect, because the fact is, there's none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. And the Bible teaches us, it's appointed unto men to die once, and after this, the judgment. 
So we all stand condemned as sinners, for none is righteous. There's not a man or a woman who's ever been born outside of Christ who's without sin. We need a Savior. And when we look at the cross, we see our Savior. We see what love will do. Love lays its life down for a friend. And Jesus laid his life down for us. He paid that price I couldn't pay. And he said, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And he dismissed it. He said, it is finished. Salvation has been won. The price has been paid. And if any man believes in Christ, comes in faith to him, says, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. I hate what I am. I can still remember. I was 20 years old when I got saved, and I still remember that season of life just prior to coming to Christ. I still remember. I hadn't prayed in so long. But I'd started praying again. And I can still remember the, prayer, remember the prayers that I was praying. It was really a simple one. And I can still remember some of the words because I would say it over and over again. I said it regularly. I said, God, help me. I can't do this anymore. God, help me. I can't stand what I am. I can't stand what I've become. I don't like what I am. It's me. I am messed up. And I would tell, that was my prayer to God at the age of 20. God, I am messed up. I hurt everybody who loves me. I can't do anything right. I have had it. I'm so frustrated. I just can't do this anymore. God, you've got to do something. And that's when he did. He broke through with the gospel. And he pointed to me the one who could do what I couldn't do. He pointed to me Jesus Christ, the one who took upon himself my sin, the one who successfully did that which I could never do, completely obeyed his father, was perfect in every way, and yet he took upon himself my sin so that I could have his righteousness. What a God that we serve who loves us so much. He gave us what we cannot have for ourselves. He did that for us. He did it for you. Perhaps there are some in this room right now who know you're breaking everybody's heart. You're rotten to the bone and you know it. You can lie, you can steal, you can go out on your wife, you can be bad to your children. Nobody really knows who you are. You put on a face, a mask. People think you're cool, you're good, you're right. But you know what you are. And you're sick of yourself, and you're sick of what you've done, and you're sick of what you are. And you think, there's no hope for you. Well, no, there is, through Jesus Christ. There's no hope if you try to do it on your own. Of course not. But there is hope because of Christ. Because Jesus Christ can give you the power to overcome. He can forgive you of every single sin that you've ever committed. There's not a single sin his blood is not powerful enough to cleanse you from. Not a single sin. He can wash you and make you new in a heartbeat, in an instant. He can say, when you say, God, be merciful to me, he says, I am merciful to you. Go and sin no more. I will give you the power to be that which you cannot be on your own. I will take your dirty rags and I will exchange my robes of righteousness, and I will make you pure as the sun. You'll be like the snow. I will cleanse you, and I will wash you. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, Good Friday, it's a really great Friday. Because as painful as it is for us to go through these things and to see what took place and just to touch some of these things, we need to remember why he did that. He did that for us. He was fastened to that cross. He yielded his life. They took him off that cross. They took him to a borrowed tomb. All of their hope was gone. But like they just said, that was Friday. Sunday was coming. Sunday was coming. 